Thank you, Marla. So uh, I have to apologize. I changed the uh, title of my talk. And uh, instead of a unique approach to address concentrator photovoltaic cost and performance challenges, it's a highly engineered approach. And hopefully this is more descriptive of what I'll talk about this afternoon. So I'll go through the challenges for HCPV, uh, some HCPV fundamentals. And when I say HCPV, I'm talking about high concentration photovoltaic. And uh, I'll review the uh, Semprius highly engineered approach, uh, give you a five-year prediction, and then some conclusions. So the first challenge and the foremost challenge is cost. Uh, everyone's familiar with the decline in uh, silicon pricing, um, but it is starting to stabilize in the 60 to 70 per, uh, cent per watt uh, range. Uh, there's a strong demand and uh, an increasing demand for PV across all the global markets. And the supply-demand relationship, you know, basically the uh, difference between supply and demand uh, is starting to stabilize and come to equilibrium. And you can see that in the, the red curve on the, the bottom right. And also uh, policy outlook is improving. So the solar market fundamentals continue to uh, stabilize and improve. And for HCPV, um, cost reductions uh, will continue to be engineered and will significantly benefit from learning curve uh, improvements especially since volumes are very low right now for CPV. So there's a lot of upside. So performance is the second challenge. And so I'm showing the uh, famous NREL chart of uh, efficiency over time. And what I'm going to do is concentrate on the upper right-hand corner. And I'm going to blow it up so we can see it. And you can see that um, NREL, Spectrolab, Spire, Solar Junction, and Sharp have all contributed to improvements in three junction um, solar cell efficiencies over the, the last decade. And you can also see Soytech uh, with their new four junction results uh, coming in at 43.6%. Uh, Sharp currently has the world record at 44.4% efficiency. So these are quite uh, high efficiencies. And uh, as I'll talk later, uh, there's no place to go but up in terms of uh, those efficiencies in the future. So I did a, a very quick linear regression of the um, progress over the last decade, and it's been about a 2.7% increase per year uh, relative in efficiency um, uh, over the last 10 years. And as, as I said, there's still a lot of uh, headroom for improvement beyond that. The next challenge is, uh, is performance, as I said, and Aminix has recently um, announced a 35.9% uh, efficient module uh, just last week. So uh, that's quite an impressive uh, result. And this was certified by NREL, who took that on sun data and extrapolated back to room temperature uh, for a, a, a CSTC um, certification. Reliability is the next challenge. And uh, I can say that great strides have been made in characterizing and improving HCPV uh, reliability over the past few years. Uh, IEC and UL standards have been developed and are being implemented. Uh, field installations uh, total between 100 and 200 megawatts now. Um, Suncor has the largest installation at 50 megawatts in western China. Uh, Aminix has a 30 megawatt plant in Colorado. Uh, Soytech is in the process of installing a 44 megawatt plant in uh, South Africa, and so on. So uh, all of these uh, contribute to uh, an increase in confidence as these systems go into place. Uh, Multi-junction cell uh, reliability is proven, and uh, in fact, it's used for very high reliability space applications. And fundamentally, gallium arsenide um, material is used for uh, RF and optoelectronic devices, which have demonstrated um, greater than a, a million devices, device hours. So uh, very reliable material. Uh, the module reliability, of course, is dependent upon the actual design. Uh, Soytech has a lot of experience and has uh, been quoted as saying they've seen no degradation uh, that's measurable over uh, four years of operation. 
So uh, that's uh, quite impressive. And most CPV companies are warranting um, less than half a percent per year of degradation. Also a, a high confidence. And then the system reliability is primarily dependent upon inverter and uh, tracker um, uh, reliability. And tracker reliability is, of course, is dependent upon design as well. Uh, a good design uh, is reliable. And uh, there's a new IEC standard, um, uh, 62727, uh, which will also go a long way toward improving tracker reliability in the future. So let me go into HCPV fundamentals. Um, this will be a re review for most people. Um, the effective concentration is the, the first topic, and uh, the geometric concentration ratio is defined as the ratio of the lens aperture area to the cell active area. Uh, so when you hear numbers like uh, 500x or 1000x, that's what uh, people are referring to. Uh, the cell current uh, rises linearly with intensity um, but the voltage arises logarithmically, so that's how we get our benefit in concentration. Um, the, uh, the upper limit, though, is going to be based upon uh, series resistance and thermal effects. Uh, so you get I squared R losses uh, if you have uh, high series resistance uh, that will compensate for that efficiency improvement. And typically, the uh, change in power as a function of temperature uh, is about uh, minus 0.14 or 0.15 percent per degree C. Uh, there are numerous optical approaches toward achieving that concentration. Um, most of them are refractive. Uh, Semprius uh, is one of those companies. Soytech, Suncor, Aminix, Abengoa, Suntrix, Dido Steel, and others all use um, a refractive approach. Some of them use uh, silicone on glass. Uh, Fresnel uh, designs, uh, others use PMMA Fresnel designs, uh, and then there are reflective designs. Um, solar Systems in Australia, uh, Renew in um, uh, Arizona, uh, use reflective uh, dish type approaches. Uh, but they're all going to be limited by the Etendu uh, limit, and so uh, there's an angle of acceptance, uh, which is the angle between the normal to the sun and the optical axis. And that is inversely proportional to the uh, concentration, as you can see uh, the equation on the right. So as concentration goes up, the angle of acceptance goes down, uh, and that requires uh, greater tracking accuracy. And what I've done here is plotted the Etendu limit, which is the red curve in the upper right-hand corner. Um, and you can see that um, uh, just like most um, you know, theoretical curves, it, it's hard to approach that. There are many uh, non-idealities that affect the practical limit. And so shaded in yellow, you can see what most CPV companies have in the terms of the acceptance angle as a function of concentration. And then there's the optical spectrum for the sun. It's very broadband, and uh, if it was monochromatic, uh, life as an engineer would be much easier. Um, life would be boring because everything would be the same color, but we'd have uh, efficiencies that would be in the 70 to 80 percent range. Um, but instead we have uh, thermalization losses um, as a result of um, high energy photons that are absorbed above the band gap uh, and they create phonons and, and uh, result in heat. Uh, and there are also low energy uh, photons which just pass through and are not absorbed. And so we, what we tend to do is uh, slice up the spectrum and we design uh, solar cells for each portion of the spectrum and then stack them up. And so multi-junction cells um, minimize the, the thermalization effects and the uh, sub-band gap losses. And here you can see um, the effect of adding uh, junctions. Um, right now, the state of the art is a, a triple junction solar cell, but uh, you can add more junctions and uh, increase the efficiency. The top curve shows uh, theoretically what's possible, but again, uh, non-idealities um, uh, bring that curve down. Uh, the fact that there is uh, non-radiative recombination, um, the series resistance is non-zero, and so on. Um, and so I've shown a, a practical curve below it, and uh, you can see for one junction it's about 28 percent, and that's consistent with what Alta Devices has demonstrated. Uh, the three-junction uh, 
uh, is consistent with the current uh, world record of 44.4 percent. But you can see it's, um, it's at about five uh, junctions, so uh, we should be able to exceed 50 percent efficiency. On the right-hand side, uh, you can see an example of a seven-junction structure that's uh, been proposed by Harry Atwater at uh, Caltech. And uh, if you look carefully, you'll notice that um, uh, he's actually, depending upon different material systems that are all uh, not uh, lattice-matched to gallium arsenide. And so um, <clears throat> what I mean by that is uh, on this band gap versus lattice constant uh, chart, uh, you can see the green line there shows um, all of the materials that are lattice matched to uh, gallium arsenide or, or germanium. And uh, a typical triple junction cell is uh, indium gallium phosphide on gallium arsenide on germanium. Uh, you can see the dilute nitride gallium indium nitride arsenide that solar junction offers, which is a, a one EV cell, uh, which is one of the reasons why their efficiency is, um, is so much higher. Uh, but if you were to open up uh, the lattice constant constraint and grow on other uh, materials such as indium phosphide, you could completely open up the range of band gaps available um, and uh, you can uh, approach um, the one EV cell um, much more easily. So there are some examples of uh, these uh, four and five junction cells uh, using wafer bonding technology. And um, I'm going to show you two of them that were just announced this year. Uh, so Soytech, with um, help from Fraunhofer, announced a four-junction uh, wafer-bonded uh, solar cell, um, two junctions grown on gallium arsenide and two on indium phosphide, and they've demonstrated 43.6%. Um, not quite a, a world record overall, but uh, very close to it. And um, this is with a non-optimized structure, so lots of room for improvement. Uh, Spectralab has also uh, demonstrated a, a wafer-bonded approach using five junctions and demonstrated 40.8% uh, at 10 suns. Uh, so again, with some improvement in tunnel junction performance and the reduction in series resistance, uh, that efficiency should be in the, in the high 40s in time. So stay tuned for more announcements. And. Um, one of the other design considerations for HCPV is the fact that the modules have to be on two axis trackers, uh, and that's because of that uh, angle of acceptance uh, limit that I talked about earlier. Um, but one of the benefits uh, is that uh, energy yield is improved. And so the uh, blue shaded area uh, is energy that is uh, captured uh, beyond what a flat panel um, uh, would uh, capture in a fixed orientation. And that results in about 30 to 40 percent higher energy yield. And here's how it uh, benefits um, uh, the overall land use. Uh, this is a report that just came out from NREL um, a few weeks ago, and it shows that uh, CPV uh, is the most uh, land efficient um, uh, solar technology. Uh, so 2.8 acres. Uh, can generate uh, one gigawatt hour um, per year of energy. Uh, so let me move over to um, uh, the Semprius approach and, and what we've done. So our core technology is something called microtransfer printing. Uh, and this is uh, spun out of the University of Illinois. Uh, and it's essentially a, a massively parallel pick and place technology. So instead of just picking up one solar cell at a time, we can pick up um, between 4,000 and 5,000 solar cells. And we can print them uh, all in one fell swoop and then go back for another four or 5,000. And so this leads to many benefits. Um, one is very small solar cells, and that uh, allows us to have a very short optical path for the optics. And uh, that results in a very low profile, lightweight CPV module. Uh, we also have distributed heat generation and so we have no heat sinks on the back of the module. That saves on cost and on weight, uh, which also helps to reduce tracker costs. Uh, low series resistance um, uh, results in higher efficiency and the ability to go to higher concentrations, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, epitaxial liftoff is uh, a means by which you can reuse the substrate, um, and that leads to lower costs. 
And the wafer level packaging uh, allows us to use standard uh, surface mount technology for the assembly of the module. Um, and this is a scalable, um, highly reliable, uh, industry standard methodology. Uh, but the other thing it allows us to do is to use a um, self-aligned um, uh, glass secondary optic. Uh, and that improves the, um, the optical flux uh, uniformity across the cell, which again leads to higher efficiency. Um, and uh, also a higher acceptance angle. Finally, it uh, enables the use of mechanically stacked cells. Uh, not too different than the wafer bonding I was just talking about, but instead of at the wafer level, uh, it would be at the cell level. Uh, so this eliminates the lattice mismatch constraint and it also mitigates the uh, series current mismatch constraint uh, because we can access those um, cells uh, independently uh, and electrically. And so this, again, leads to higher efficiency. And the way we do it is uh, we procure epi wafers uh, from our uh, partners and, uh, and different foundries around the world. Uh, we do all of the wafer processing ourselves, And then we employ our microtransfer printing uh, technology to, to print those uh, cells onto um, a uh, wafer which we then uh, sent through our wafer level packaging uh, process. Uh, then we surface mount them, assemble the module, and then deploy them in the field on trackers. And this is a, a picture of the uh, module with all of the benefits that I've mentioned around the edges. And looking inside, you can see that the Optics are based upon a silicone on glass technology. Uh, the lenses are very small uh, because the cells are small. Um, in fact, our cells are only 600 microns by 600 microns, so uh, smaller than the uh, period at the end of a sentence. And this uh, allows us to have a very short um, focal point uh, and a very thin profile. We've got some third-party uh, measurements of um, efficiency. Uh, these were measured at the University of Madrid. And uh, there were, you can see four different IV curves, very similar to each other. And uh, the efficiencies spanned 34.8% to uh, about 35.6%. Uh, this is a distribution of the factory efficiencies. So, um, we're, we're quite proud of the fact that um, these results are not based upon uh, HERO experiments. They're uh, modules right off of the, the factory line. Uh, you can see that the median of the distribution is 33%, um, and the range is uh, anywhere from 30% uh, up to about 34.5%. Uh, the standard deviation is, is quite small, about 0.6%. And what this does is it leads to series resistance mismatch um, loss minimization once they go onto a tracker. And then I mentioned the uh, angle of acceptance limitation uh, in the past due to uh, concentration. Uh, our angle of acceptance as measured by NREL is plus or minus 0.8%, which is uh, plenty of angle of acceptance uh, to address um, you know, any commercial trackers. We have a system in uh, Tucson, Arizona, uh, which we use to measure uh, energy yield. And so this plot shows the energy yield um, each month from October of 2011 uh, through uh, the spring of uh, this year. Uh, and if you look at uh, 2012 uh, as a whole, uh, we generated uh, just under 2,200 uh, kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak per year. Um, there are some other systems at that exact same site. Uh, they're co-located there. So we can compare um, to a uh, five megawatt fixed uh, silicon plant, uh, which generated uh, about 1677 kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak per year, and a uh, 1.6 megawatt plant on uh, one axis. Uh, a tracker, and that generated uh, 1966 kilowatt hours. So quite favorable with respect to those other systems because of the two-axis tracker. And we, we have uh, several different tracker partners, um, and this is an example of one of them. 
Uh, it's a 64 square meter uh, tracker, which generates 17.5 kilowatts of power and uh, takes uh, 200 of our uh, modules to populate it. Uh, the tracking accuracy for this tracker is plus or minus 0.1 uh, degree, so it's, it's quite accurate. And uh, the peak efficiency that uh, we've demonstrated is uh, about 30%. And uh, to our knowledge, this is the highest system efficiency um, reported for a production HCPV system. This is our latest installation. It um, uh, was just installed last week. Uh, it's just a single tracker, um, but it's out in uh, Denver at the Solar SolarTAC uh, facility. And this was in collaboration with uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne, uh, which used to be called uh, Pratt & Whitney Rocketdyne, um, also with EPRI and NREL. And uh, this, um, this makes the 14th uh, system that we've installed worldwide now. Uh, I really like this slide because it shows the, the power of concentration. So uh, you can see the number of six inch wafers required to fully populate a, a tracker. So for our smallest tracker, the uh, 54 square meter tracker, only 2.7 wafers are required to populate it. Um, and for the largest tracker, only 4.7. And if you look really carefully in the, the bottom right hand corner of each of those pictures, you can actually see those wafers to scale. Um, and it just, uh, just shows um, how uh, powerful concentration is in terms of reducing the semiconductor costs. So let me talk about our next generation design. Uh, this um, utilizes uh, stacked cells uh, for higher performance. Uh, we get um, a lower cost from increasing the concentration ratio. And together they lower the dollar per watt um, and lower the LCOE. So by, by next year, by in 2014, uh, we expect the LCOE to be comparable to a silicon on a one axis tracker. Uh, and this would be in uh, regions that have uh, direct normal insulation greater than 2,000 kilowatts, kilowatt hours per uh, meter squared per year. And you can see it on this plot, the, um, uh, the red line and, and yellow line uh, represent the uh, fixed tilt and one axis trackers. Uh, and it's the LCOE versus um, DNI. And the dark blue curve shows uh, Sempreus uh, next year and um, it intersects that a silicon on a one axis tracker curve um, at a, a DNI of 2000. And so as time goes on, uh, that curve will be pushed down further as we put our next generation design into, into a production. So this is the, the cell efficiency roadmap. And uh, these are not you know, the best numbers. These aren't uh, what we would call a record. Um, these are the, the median manufacturing efficiencies over time and you can see that um, in five years we expect to approach 50% uh, efficiency at the cell level. And the way we plan to do that is by migrating from uh, monolithically integrated structures to uh, heterogeneously stacked structures um, uh, which I described previously. And advantages include um, the fact that you can uh, print materials with any lattice constant uh, over a wide range of band gaps. Uh, the ability to reuse both of the substrates, whether it's uh, gallium arsenide or indium phosphide. Uh, the uh, mismatch in epi wafer size um, can also be addressed. Uh, it, it would be very difficult in a wafer bonding um, uh, scenario to do that, but uh, we can print from a, a four inch wafer or a six inch wafer just as easily. And um, uh, room temperature, uh, uh, process uh, for printing uh, compared to a high temperature wafer bonding process um, reduces stresses. And then finally, the, the small cells allow for higher concentration um, as well as improved current management and the ability to wire them up in different uh, configurations. And so this is what it looks like. Uh, this is actually an actual demonstration uh, that we've completed earlier this year. It's a three junction uh, printed on top of a one junction. And you can see here an image of um, the stack cells. And what we're doing is we're looking at the uh, interface uh, between the two and um, we were looking for voiding and we don't see any embedded voids in the, uh, between the cells. Uh, 
This is a uh, quantum efficiency curve showing all four junctions um, and uh, it's a very good uh, quantum efficiency. And then finally, um, efficiency as a function of concentration uh, for both the top and bottom and the overall efficiency resulted in 43.9%. This is our module efficiency roadmap. So we have plans to improve uh, the optical efficiency in the module. Uh, up to about uh, 42% uh, within the next five years. And uh, at the same time, uh, we're cost reducing the module um, by increasing uh, efficient, I'm sorry, increasing concentration ratio. Uh, so we're going from 1,100 suns to uh, 1,600 suns. Uh, that reduces the uh, receiver costs by about 32%, uh, which is a, a very significant cost reduction. Uh, if you look closely, you'll notice on the left-hand side, the, the uh, 1600 concentration has larger lenses than um, our standard uh, production process on the right-hand side. And so we have plans to qualify this uh, in the fall. And um, to our knowledge, this um, is the first uh, commercial implementation of concentration uh, greater than 1300 suns. So here is... Um, uh, several plots uh, showing um, efficiency, VOC, and fill factor as a function of concentration. And you can see uh, at 1300 suns um, where the, uh, the concentration or where the efficiency is, it's just under uh, 42%. Um, but by going to um, 1600 suns, it drops just a little bit. Um, so there is a, a small decrease in efficiency, um, and that can be improved upon with a reduction in series resistance. Uh, but with that, we get a, a tremendous um, reduction in cost, uh, as I said earlier. These are some uh, results from the uh, 1600 uh, uh, concentration modules. And you can see that the efficiencies are about 33%, um, very, uh, very much comparable to our production uh, efficiencies at uh, 1100 cents. And so I, uh, I mentioned that uh, I would provide a uh, five-year prediction. And so what I'm showing here is the cell efficiency uh, over time. Uh, we're, I just extrapolated uh, linearly the uh, NREL efficiency chart, um, the 2.7% uh, relative per year. And uh, you can see that it crosses the 50% um, mark at about um, 2017. And I've also overlaid the solar junction prediction that uh, Vijit Sapnis uh, presented at InterSolar uh, North America last summer. And you can see it, it matches uh, quite nicely. Um, and there's also a, a point on here which is um, Soytex uh, prediction uh, for 2015. Um, they're predicting that they will reach 50%. Uh, and the reason that uh, that's off the line is because they're employing that uh, wafer bonding technology that I was referring to. So quite exciting. I, I think there'll be uh, a lot more um, exciting announcements um, in the coming uh, 12 months. So in conclusion, um, uh, rapidly increasing uh, efficiencies will continue to drive down cost per watt at the system level, uh, competitive with uh, silicon PV, uh, and there's still plenty of headroom. Uh, engineered cost reductions and economies of scale will further benefit uh, HCPV costs. Um, volume is just beginning to scale up. And uh, Semprius expects to exploit its uh, performance to cost ratio uh, advantages to capture market share. So thank you. <laughs>